Revelation 10. Now, um, again, my, my premise, and if anything nails it for me, it's this, it's this right here, okay? Uh, my idea is that this, it has to be Jesus. It, it just, it has to be. Uh, he, he is called, Jesus is called an angel all throughout scriptures. He's higher than all of the rest of the angels, but he's still the angel of the Lord. He's the angel that uh, was prophesied, we're gonna, was going to lead the people of Israel uh, into the promised land. Uh, he is the angel that Jacob wrestled with, uh, and he mentions that specifically, so we know that to be a fact. Uh, he came down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud. We know that Jesus um, uh, went to heaven in a cloud. He's coming back in a cloud. Um, uh, he is uh, in the clouds, with the clouds, clothed with a cloud, and so on. The rainbow was upon his head. When you look at Ezekiel 1, the rainbow clearly is a picture of the glory of the Lord. And it's, it's, it's over the top of the throne of God that God is sitting on. Uh, and I would say in this case, it would, be, it would be Christ sitting on that throne with the, with the glory of the Lord over his head. If you read Ezekiel 1 and get down toward the bottom, that's exactly what you're going to see. Um, his face was as it were the sun. Again, we saw at least a half a, half a dozen verses that just outright say, uh, that the Lord is a son, capital S-U-N, he's the son of righteousness. Uh, the Lord is the son in the shield in Matthew 17. When he, on the Mount of Transfiguration, his face shines like the sun. Moses being a, a type of that, a pre, um, uh, what's another word, an allegory of that or, a, or typology or a foreshadowing of that. Uh, when he came down from Mount Sinai the second time, his face was shining so bright they had to put a veil over his face because people couldn't look at him. His face was shining like the sun. And Moses was acting out a prophecy of Jesus Christ coming down from heaven. And what did, what did Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai, what was Moses holding in his hand? Huh? The Ten Commandments. The the written word of God, right? Now, what is in this angel's hand? Don't look at me, look at your Bible. A book. He, this, is, this is Christ. Moses is acting out a prophecy. That's what typology is. Or foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is a, is a well-known literary construct that basically, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a way of sort of giving away the end of the book at the beginning of the book. You have a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. And in the Bible, you have foreshadows of all over, the, especially the Old Testament. It always foreshadows something in the in New Testament or something that is going to happen uh, in the last days. Uh, I don't have time to give you all that, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. And so he has his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open. Now, um, the fact that it's, oh, oh, let me see here where we're going with this. Okay. The fact that it's open, I believe that this book that he has in his hand open is the book that was given to him five chapters previous. The fact that when I, I have Revelation 3, 7 up here, the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and, and shutteth and no man openeth. So let's go back to Revelation 5. We're going to see this book. This book that's open in this angel's hand, the only one worthy to open that book is Jesus Christ. I'm your pastor. I'm the preacher. Uh, it's my job to labor in the word, 
daily. It's my job to study the word. It's my job to know the word. It's my job then to give you what I have. But I don't have the ability to open this book up to your hearing and your understanding. Only God can do that. I've read the Bible. Okay? I've read the Bible and I had a little conversation with God every day or yesterday. And I, and I said, God, thank you that I believe your book. I believe every word of it. God did that to me. He did that for me. He did that in me. It wasn't my own intellect. It wasn't my own reasoning saying, I think this, I think the Bible is far superior to any other religious text that there. It wasn't that. It's one day the Lord said, Mike, this, this book's right. You know it. Boom, instantly. I believe it. There are other people who have read the Bible. Alexander Scorby, who, who has that beautiful, beautiful, magnificent voice reading the entire Bible. Sterling has that on CD in his truck. Every time he turns his truck on, he's got an Alexander Scorby CD reading something out of the Bible. You know, that man was hired to read the Bible. He read the whole Bible. They recorded every word of it. He didn't believe a word of it. How can he read the whole Bible and not believe it? Others have studied the Bible. There are professors at universities who study the Bible and teach it, but they don't believe it. There are people behind pulpits who read the Bible to people. They don't believe it. Who's the only one that can open it up to our understanding? It's Jesus Christ. He's the only one worthy. So Revelation 5, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Now, this is so cool because the two tablets that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with his face shining like the sun, the two tablets in his hand were written on the front and the back, just like you see here. Okay? Now, you're going to see me, as I go through this, it's going to take several weeks, you're going to see me smile, you're going to see me chuckle a little bit, you're going to see me shout amen, because I love this, especially when you see where I'm going with it. Hopefully you will love, hopefully you will love this book, as much or more as I do or anybody else does because of, because of what God has done in it and with it and everything else. Everything about my life and this church and our ministry is right here. It's not me. It's the book. So anyway, here's the book in God's right hand, the right hand is the right hand of, uh, is the hand of strength. And that's where Jesus is. Uh, <laughs> this Bible was given to King James in 1611. Psalm 1611 says, at thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. What's in God's right hand? The book. And when you read the Bible, I'm telling you, there's pleasures in here that's better than drugs. Amen. All right. Uh, and again, you'll have to excuse my, um, my joy. You'll have to excuse it because I, I just get, I get un, unhinged on this. So anyway, verse, uh, it was written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Um, the Holy Spirit of pro we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and there's seven spirits of God and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book neither to look thereon that is sad, isn't it? How many people have you tried to share scriptures with? And they didn't appreciate it. They didn't want to hear it. 
They got mad. They told you, I don't want to hear this stuff anymore. We've had people uh, call our ministry and ask us to put some uh, relative of theirs or somebody they know on our mailing list, which means they get DVDs from our ministry every month. After about six months, we get a call from that person saying, and they're, they're really upset about it. They say, I don't know how I got on your mailing list, but I'm sick of getting your DVDs and your junk every month. I throw it in the garbage. I want you to take my name off your list. And I don't want to get no more of this junk. Now, do you under, I mean, they're hateful about it. And we go, sure, yeah, well, no problem. And it aggravates me because they call us chewing us out. They don't, they didn't know who it was that they knew that put them on our list. They should be calling them chewing them out, but we take the chewing over it. And we've had people put as many as 10 people on their, on their, on our mailing list and after we started getting calls like that, I, I shut that off. And I said, if, if you want somebody to get our DVDs, have them call our ministry and we'll be glad to put them on there. And we don't charge anything for that. We, don't, we never have charged anything for that. Uh, but the, the bottom line is they, they may watch one of them and say, this guy's an idiot. Take the DVD out, throw it away. And be done with it. And what happened is it wasn't a failure on my part that I didn't say what needed to be said. It wasn't a failure on the, the discs weren't bad. It wasn't that I was reading out of some other strange religious book or whatever. The fact of the matter is, for whatever reason, God has not opened up his book to their understanding. On the other side is, I love to tell this story about the man, who, he's, he's single, he's an uh, older, older gentleman, lives by himself in an apartment, goes to the laundromat, does his laundry, he sees all these DVDs that somebody left there on the folding table, and he's folding his clothes, putting them in the basket, and he looks at them and he says, I'll take this one, and he puts it on top of his clothes, he drives to his apartment, Puts his clothes away, remembers he's got the DVD, pops it in, he watches it. He gets in his car and goes back to the laundromat and he gets all the rest of the DVDs that are on the table. And he watch, he binge watches me like, like he's watching Friends or something like that. And uh, he's like, he's, he wrote me and said that because of that, he used to be Catholic, because of that, he, he asked the Lord into his life, asked God to forgive him of his sins, asked God to save him, and he went out and bought a King James Bible, and he said, I'll be watching you from now on. God opened up the word to that man. Y'all see how that works? You can, some people, you can give them verses after verses after verses, and all you're going to do is make them mad because to them it's closed and this angel or John wept because no man could open the book and it bothers us when we try to share our faith and what we believe with people and they don't they're not gonna get it they're not gonna buy it we got we got good Christian parents raising children in a godly manner and i'm thinking of a family right now i i love them dearly but so far three uh, two out of their three children they're all adults now and two of those three kids i know for a fact have turned completely i mean 180 degrees away from where mom and dad raised them it's sad it makes us weep anyway verse 5 one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So, we, if we go back to Revelation 10, 
he has in his hand a little book open. That tells me that that started out in Revelation 5. He was given the book, and then in Revelation 6, he begins to open the seals of the book. So that when we get to Revelation 10, all the seals now have been opened. And when he comes down, he's got the book in his hand open. Why is it open? Because he opened it. He's the only one worthy to open it. And that, I'll, I'll show you why I think this book has an adjective attached to it. You know what, a, remember what an adjective is? It describes a noun. That's a car. What kind of car? A red car. Uh, a piece of junk car. That's an adjective, okay? So the adjective to this book is little. A little book. Okay? But think of what a little book can do in a person's life. You know, when we witness to someone and we're going to pray the sinner's prayer to them, we've read them, what, maybe five verses out of the whole Bible? Uh, Romans 3.23, 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, John 3.16, uh, and then 1 John 1, 9. So at, at most, maybe six verses we give them out of the whole Bible. And six verses is powerful enough to open a man's heart and cause him to pour out his sin before a holy God and ask God for forgiveness and six verses out of the Bible. In fact, you could just, you could take one away and still have that much power to change a man's entire life. And so it's a little book, all right? Now, so... What I did one day was I wanted to understand, I read commentaries when I was studying Revelation 5 years ago. I read commentaries. Oh, this is the book of this. This is the book of that. And, and I'm like, where do they get this stuff from? I, I want to know what this book is. So I did what I do. I started searching for the word book. And here's some of the verses. I mean... Um, I'll show you in a minute how many times the word book is mentioned in the Bible. But it took me a little while to go through it, I'll say that. In Exodus 17, 14, the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I want you to th think about how important it is that we have the word of God written down. Okay? You have the title to your car written down, don't you? You have, and if you haven't got it paid for, you've got the contract that you bought the car with written on paper, don't you? You don't, we don't shake hands with people anymore and say, I'll do this and you do that. Because I guarantee you, you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose, okay? So we don't do that anymore because can't trust people. So imagine then these, these ideas, these laws, these precepts that we all take for granted. We, everybody knows the Ten Commandments, or at least they know most of the Ten Commandments. How do we know them? Were they passed down from generation to generation, from ear to ear to ear? No, they were... What did, how did it all start? God wrote them down. He wrote them on tables of stone with his own finger. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. The first time he breaks them, second time he comes down. There they are. The handwriting is that of God. He shows it to them front and back. This is the hand of God that wrote these down so that there's no, uh, there's no discussion on them. We don't have to vote on them. There's nobody can say, well, I thought I heard God say, thou shall not kill uh, men but we can kill women 
Maybe somebody would argue what the Ten Commandments were. But now that they're written down, there's no argument. In courts of law, a judge and a jury and a, and a lawyer would much rather have a document to give as evidence more than eyewitness testimony. Tell me why. Tell me why. And your perception changes over time, doesn't it? Huh? It's right. It's called memorialized. Somebody sees a car hit another car and the car drives off. Somebody right then takes their phone out and they send a text to somebody with the license plate number. And they say, send this back to me so I'll have it on my phone. And they keep it on their phone. It's memorialized. So they can go to, and whoever's driving the car say, well, I wasn't even there. I wasn't even around this place. I don't know who you're talking about. And they bring in this witness who's got it on their phone. They wrote this license plate number down. They saw you hit the car. Do you think that they just made your license plate up? No, they memorialized it. Look at what it says here. Write this for a what? Memorial. Why? So it could be remembered correctly. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll, it'll, did. You can't even, you can't whisper something in one person's ear and, and they'll get it right. Okay, and you guys, I don't know if you caught what I just said. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That, huh? Prove it. There you go. His only begotten son. Does it matter if, it, if another Bible says his one and only son? Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. We are sons of God. The Bible says that, New Testament, in about four or five places. We are sons of God. Christ is not the one and only son. Son. He's the only begotten Son. There's a difference. So, when people say, oh, all the Bibles are the same, if you start comparing them, you'll find out that's not true. It is not. That's what I did. I went compare. In fact, I've got Christina... Right now, she's working on a project for me. I found a, a 1973 edition of the NIV New Testament. 73 was the first year the NIV came out. And I found it like at a resale shop, so I bought it. And the reason why I bought it is, as I know for a fact now, that if you go to any, any store that sells Bibles, Walmart sells Bibles, whatever, and you buy... A current edition NIV. The NIV from 73 is not the same NIV as the NIV that's out now. And you know what she's doing? She's going through page by page, scripture by scripture, writing, typing out the verses that are different just, just between the two NIV Bibles. And she's already got over, I don't know how many, hundreds, hundreds of verses that are different now from the same, same version of the Bible, the NIV. They're different. They changed it five times since 1973. How can you memorize, how can you memorialize Bible verses from a Bible that 
has already changed the verse that you memorized 20 years ago and is going to change it again. How can you do that? Huh? Something ain't right. Amen. You know what that is? Jesus said it. He said, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. So anyway, that's one purpose for writing it, writing it down. We, like I say, we write contracts down. We write uh, notes. Uh, there's somebody I talked to yesterday. Uh, they are, they are, uh, what, I don't know what the word, they're giving themselves therapy by writing down their feelings and their thoughts every day. And once they get them written down, uh, they said to me, uh, after a while, I'll tear them out and, just, and throw them in the fire and burn them. I don't need them anymore. But I just had to write this down, get it out of me. But we write contracts, we write out everything that is important that we have, we look for papers on it. We have a lock, we have a safe in our house and we have a lock box in, a fireproof lock box inside the safe that has our most important papers in them. Because if you don't have them, try going to the license office. You know what I'm talking about? If they, if someone tells you you need two copies of something, license office will always tell you, oh no, you need three. So go back home. We'll see you next month. Anyway, Exodus 24, 7. He took the book of the covenant. Now, a covenant is a contract. I was saved under the terms of this contract, Brother George. This was read to me from a youth. I believed it. And I was saved by, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness. Uh, by, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I memorized them. I was saved with those, with the words of that contract. When you hand me a different Bible, you're handing me a different contract. And if, and if the person, let, let's say that you've got, let's say that you've, your family has a hundred year lease on a property. And the lease was written out 80, 75, 60 years ago, okay? Your grandpa leased the property from somebody and the lease was all written out and signed and memorialized and all that stuff. 60 years later, 70 years later, the person who owns the property comes to you and has a new lease and, and they say, give me the old lease. I'm going to give you this new lease. This new lease is better. The original lease that was written 70 years ago. It's actually better. It's better. For, in fact, this lease better than you can that. Any takers? Why? And why would you trust somebody who handed you an updated lease, updating it without your permission? And then saying to you, oh, don't worry, it says the same, it's just in a different language. And it's better than that lease that you have. Now, we're talking about a piece of land, a piece of stupid land. After you die, do you own land anywhere on the earth? No. Your ownership of land ceases when you die. We're talking about eternal life. Something that important. I got to move on. Deuteronomy 30 verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book. So Joseph Smith comes along in 1830 and says that God gave him another testament. We have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and another testament, the Book of Mormon. According to this verse, that testament that Joe Smith came up with, null and void. In fact, 
It was nullified at the end of the book of Revelation, at the last chapter of the book of Revelation. If any man adds to the words that are written in this book, th these plagues will be added unto him. Okay? And how did Joseph Smith's life end? Does anybody know? <coughs> Do what? No, the <coughs> founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. Huh? <coughs> I'm pretty sure, look it up, check me if I'm wrong. A crowd, a, a, a gang, um, bearing torches, stormed the jail cell that he was in took him out and hung him. Check me out if I'm right on that. If I'm right on that, what does the Bible say about someone that's hung? So someone look that up, make sure I'm right. I don't want to lie. But anyway, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn to the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. In other words, this is the place where you're going to find God's laws and his statutes. Somebody says that, well, if you do this, this is a sin. Hand them a Bible and say, show it to me. Because if it's not in here, it's not a sin. And I will not be under your bondage. Now, Psalm 40, verse 7. Look at this one. Uh, and this also was in Hebrews chapter 10. If you open your Bible to Hebrews 10. Then I, uh, in Psalm 40, verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. If you look in Hebrews 10, verse, uh, verse 7, he's quoting this, Paul's quoting this, and he said, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. This is the words. I love this. Because the very words... That Jesus spoke before he left heaven to come down to earth to be born as a baby in Bethlehem. Jesus said these words. How did, how did Paul know that Jesus said these words? How did David know that Jesus said these words? The Holy Ghost told him. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So here's, here's my favorite thing from um, idiotic preachers. Mike, not everything that God does is in the Bible. Well, according to the Bible, it is. When Jesus came, just before he left heaven, he said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do thy will. In other words, everything that Jesus did was according to the book. George, that company you work for. And I, I'm, at, I'm bringing this question to you because of things that you've told me. Okay, you've been called on the carpet more than once. Okay? That company you work for. Did they have rules and regulations and codes and standards and so on that you had to follow? Were they verbal or were they written? How many volumes do you think that they had? A company that big? Quite a few. A room full at least? Okay. You worked for a company for what, 30 years, 40 years, something like that? You had, huh? Ten years. You had to do everything by the book. And if you didn't do it by the book, then you just opened yourself up. When something goes wrong, you've opened yourself up to liability. Because they told you in their book, don't do this. You decided to go ahead and do it. So when, if somebody got hurt and they're going to sue the company, the company's going to say, we have it in our policy 
that George's not supposed to do this. George did this against our policy and he knew our policy because he signed a document saying that he read our policy and he knew about it and he went and violated policy. We're not liable, sue George. Does that make sense? Does that sound about right to everybody? Doesn't matter if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's. They have everything written down on how you're supposed to do everything. I've, I've worked at, I, I've got experience. I worked at McDonald's for two days. And they had it up on the wall. How I was supposed to make it. Back in those days, we actually put them on a grill and seared them and flipped them and salted and peppered them. And they didn't have this, all this new stuff now. Uh-uh. We had to do it. And I had to do it exactly the way I was told to do it. And it was done that way at every McDonald's restaurant in the world. That's how come you could go to... Saudi Arabia right now and order a McDonald's cheeseburger and it tastes exactly the same as it does here in Festus. Same thing. Uh, I come in the volume book is written of me. Psalm 69, 28, let them be blotted out of the book. Oh, here it is, the book of the living. And not be written with the righteous. I wonder what that means. Yes, Cubby. Shot. I was wrong. Things you'll never hear a preacher say. I was wrong. They were shot. Should have been hung. Anyway. Uh, if you want to have fun this week, and I mean it, study the word book in your King James Bible. And you'll have more fun than you should ever be allowed to have. Okay? I promise you. And then I'm going to show you uh, that next Sunday. Father, we love you. Thank you for the book. Father, this book is what makes all of us equal. It makes us all the same. It makes us all sinners. It makes us all in need of your grace. It makes us, Father righteous the same way and by the same method. We thank you, God, that this one book is what binds us all together in love, unity of the Spirit. It's done by way of the book. May we, as Christ did, endeavor uh, to set ourselves to live our lives and to do things according to the book in order to do thy will. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be his word above his name. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.